Hey there, preachers. It's Joy J. Moore here. I wanted to share my gratitude for each and every one of you who've given so generously to our fall fundraising campaign so far. Thank you. Did you know that you can make monthly gifts to Working Preacher? Monthly gifts are a great budget-friendly option to fit any needs, and every gift makes an impact. In fact, we have a special gift for a limited number of monthly donors. If you're one of the first 10 donors to make a recurring gift of $10 per month or more to this ministry, then you'll receive a book by Walter Brueggemann in the Working Preacher book series titled Preaching Jeremiah, Announcing God's Restorative Passion. Or, if you're already giving monthly and increase your monthly gift, you could also be one of the 10 donors to receive the book. I feel blessed to be a part of this Working Preacher community with you. Your investment in this ministry provides the tools that thousands upon thousands of preachers around the world rely on as part of their weekly or daily routine. So head over to workingpreacher.org slash donate to make your gift online before the campaign ends on October 31st. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. I always want to jump in on you, Catherine. Uh, This week, as we are uh, moving through our narrative lectionary, um, we will be taking a look on October 20th, 24, uh, at uh, 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7, verses 1 through 17, which means an awful lot has happened. I mean, we were in the beginning of 1 Samuel uh, when we began, uh, when we finished last week, and now we're all the way through um, 2 Samuel. So a great deal has happened in the story. Uh, We've moved through the anointing of um, Saul as king. Uh, I should even go back farther to say that we've moved uh, from the uh, identification of this transition of not having a king and the people doing what was right in their own eye and then requesting a king and God warning them about the kind of king that they would get and then receiving that king and um, and this long journey from Saul, who was the first king, uh, to David, who was the second king on the throne. And... Um, Where we are right now is a little bit before uh, David gets too out of hand, uh, but we've taken the journey uh, to uh, him ascending the throne. And now uh, we have, uh, he's he's, uh, uh, brought the Ark of the Covenant to rest, and he has this uh, great idea. Um, But I want to just draw a little attention to the idea of rest Uh, Just there in the first verse, now when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. Um, We'll see this again next week as well, but something to think about is that that term rest is similar to the word rest that we read uh, in uh, the creation narrative, where um, the seventh day of creation, God sets aside as a day of rest. And in this ancient context, it would be understood that when a king is not at war, when uh, the enemies have been set aside, when it's basically at a time of peace, which is what we have through this long journey of David ascending to the throne, He's now at a point where his enemies are put aside, his immediate tasks are done, and he receives this rest. And that is the mirroring of the rest that the creator God sets uh, takes uh, after setting creation in order. That the king, uh, in this case the creator God, um, sets on his throne and allows things to peacefully take order. If you have that in your imagination as you're thinking about the words that um, uh, are are God's response to David's idea, 
um, it changes a little bit of what it means to house God or to have God um, uh, where the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. Thank you for that. I, I, I also would point, e- e- even stronger is the connection um, with the story of the flood and the story of the cycle of violence in the book of Judges. Yes. That the word here is the same word as the name Noah. And so what you have in the flood story is violence and the success, the cessation of violence is this word nuach, Noah, rest, which then becomes that you get uh, the story uh, in, in the book of Judges of this um, cycle where the people do evil in the sight of the Lord and then uh, the Lord gives them over uh, and they experience violence. Then they call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord raises up a judge and then um, the judge. And then during the judges, uh, during that judges period, they have this rest. And so uh, in in some senses, right, you continue the, the period of the what's going on that David is sort of like now like a judge in the sense that um, they have rest in his days, which sets up then David thinks he's going to do something for God. (laughs) And then this, this whole thing is built on a pun of the, that the word house can mean temple. It can mean a palace or a human house, but it can mean a dynasty. David Mm -hmm. thinks David, now that he has his house, he thinks he's going to build God a house, but instead God builds David a house. Yeah. And the, the Hebrew word there is bait. Like, uh, as in the name Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, uh, house of bread. Very, very common Hebrew word. Uh, and as Ralph just said, yeah, it can, it, basic meaning of house, but it can also mean temple. Uh, and it, in this, in this context can mean dynasty as well. God says, you're, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house, right? Uh, and, and, Talk about the the unfolding promises of God, right? This this kind of sub theme that we're suggesting for these weeks. Uh, here's an ultimate, like immensely gracious promise uh, of God to David uh, uh, that is is truly astounding. I mean, we we talk about you know the the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant at Sinai. Here we're talking about the fourth great covenant, I guess you could say, the uh, the Davidic covenant, which is what uh, carries through, which which is uh, uh, shows up in the prophets, shows up in the Psalms. God says to David, "I'm going to build you a house, meaning a dynasty, and you shall never lack for a, a descendant on the throne. Uh, I will establish your throne, your dynasty, forever." Uh, with some some qual- so this is. Um, uh, the, the commentary on this is really quite good by uh, <laughs> Professor Jacqueline Lapsley, Lapsley excuse me, uh, where she talks about, you know, this, uh, this is an unconditional covenant, uh, <laughs> and yet there's, there's um, consequences for disobedience. Uh, I'm forgetting how she puts it exactly, but she said something like, here it is. She says, the covenant is unbreakable, but that does not mean there are no consequences to okay. unfaithfulness. And of course, we're going to see that in the rest of the story of David, uh, because soon after this, uh, what I think in chapter 11, uh, is the, the, um, where where he takes another man's wife and, and kills Uriah, where he takes Bathsheba and murders Uriah. And then Nathan, the same prophet comes back and says, uh, the sword shall never depart from your house. Right. So, so God's promise remains sure, but that doesn't mean (laughs) that there are no consequences. Uh, for David's uh, sin. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, many of those consequences fall on his children, uh, the next generation. Um, I, I just want to, I'll say one more thing uh, and pass it off uh, for now, but uh, David has come in, the figure of King David has come in for a lot of criticism, shall we say, <laughs> both from scholars and from popular off, you know, people who are writing kind of uh, historical fiction uh, he comes off as just a, a, a power-hungry, murderous uh, king, that and and he somewhat deserved, I would say. I mean, uh, obviously he murders Uriah somehow uh, through 
all of First Samuel, somehow all of David's enemies die, though he always, you know, proclaims his own innocence about it. So there is some reason for viewing David negatively. And yet, David is understood in biblical uh, history, uh, uh, or in, in biblical tradition, certainly in the Psalms, uh, as the golden king of Israel. And I think some of that, uh, and I have to admit to some, you know, a soft spot in my heart for David, despite all his many, many uh, sins. Uh, I think part of that is David's zeal for God, right? That that when he is now uh, has his, you know, is resting, as you, as you both talked about, now that he has his own palace, he wants to do something for God. Mm-hmm. Uh and God says, "No, you're not going to." But just that desire to, uh, you know, to to uh, to serve God, to do something for God, I think is part of what redeems David's, <laughs> you know, many many weaknesses. In the same way that he dances before the Ark of the Covenant when he brings it into Jerusalem, right? There's a kind of uh, zeal has a maybe too negative a, a, a connotation, but he has a a devotion to a love for God. Uh, that shines through uh, even in his worst moments. There's a uh, this thread of the promise of God and God's faithfulness that we're highlighting um, makes this, uh, David makes this very evident. So God makes this uh, unconditional um, prom- covenant, um, which are the covenants that all of the covenants are actually unconditional, you know, that, that God makes the uh, the um, Mosaic Covenant actually puts a specific expectation on the response of the people, which would be um, to be peculiar in in how it li- how they live. But all the way through, God has reached out to humanity when humanity walks away from God, and it's highlighted in it. Well, it's highlighted in Abraham and Sarah. It's, you know, it's highlighted in uh, Saul, it's highlighted in Elkanah, it's highlighted in the uh, uh, the um, judges, it's highlighted in the people wandering through the wilderness. What, what am I pointing to? Over and over again, humanity keeps asking God for more than everything God has given us. And God is faithful to God's promise. So what we see in David is in this one person who, as you rightly pointed out, Catherine, has this evident devotion for God. And I would point to his response when Nathan confronts him, where we get what we believe to be the 51st Psalm, where he says, I have sinned, and that sin is against you, God. Uh, there's no dismissal of, okay, I know I'm your golden boy, so it doesn't matter what I do. I'll go and deal with the, the you know, with Bathsheba. It's, no, God, you and I have to be right, and then I can deal with all the other. That That's how I read that. That's my soft spot for David, and I think that should give us a soft spot for one another, that where we look at people who don't think like us, who are from a different culture, who we would say in this particular season, vote the wrong way. Are we willing to step back and say, while they may make errors, what is their desire in relationship to God? And at that point, maybe we should have a soft spot for them as well. I just want to tie this uh, by way of ending to the accompanying verses that we've chosen from the Gospel of Luke. Um, following up on last week, the, the 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 accompanying text is from the Magnificat, but this time it's from the start of the Magnificat. Specifically, um, well, it's actually not the Magnificat. Sorry, it's this is the That's angel's sweet. annunciation, where the angel says, Gabriel says. He will be great, that is, the child conceived and born of you. He will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him to the throne of his uh, ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That This promise given in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant, uh, which seems to be broken at the exile, the promise that one of David's descendants would forever be king over Israel, 
God finds a way to keep it in an even more full way. And it's kept in a more full way in Jesus, who reigns over God's kingdom forever. I Love to Tell the Story is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. The narrative lectionary was developed at Luther Seminary and has been hosted on Working Preacher since 2011. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash narrative. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.